welcome to the learning little show you know check us out anywhere there are podcasts youtube you name it and i just wanted to let you guys know quickly what is this show about where are you going to get from it research has shown that about half of people go on to listen to podcasts because they want to learn something and another half want to be entertained while be, you know learning something with this show i want it to be fun you know for me and the guest and for people listening in so there's generally a lot of laughs there's a lot of fun but the ultimate goal is for everyone to take something away from these calls these interviews whether it's just like a factoid whether it's a story whether it's something that they can apply to their life and at the same time get to know someone new you know each guest is doing something really fantastic and so listening in you get to learn about them and so you definitely check that box for you know learning something new and for entertainment try my best to make it fun for the guests and myself and hopefully for you guys as well today we're joined with abhi darshun product manager and one of the key leaders over at zirion a decentralized finance or DeFi for short portfolio builder very interesting and would highly recommend checking it out or sending a message to abhi to learn more he's available on linkedin as well I said of which he has experience in venture capital, AI, computational technology, ed tech, journalism, web three, and fintech. He is what I call a serial problem solver, which is what some may call a serial entrepreneur. This episode is centered on DeFi. Now quickly, what is that? DeFi is an emerging, emerging parallel monetary system of open financial services, such as savings, checking accounts, loans, assets, trading, insurance, and a, and a ton more. We actually get into a lot of that today. Being primarily built on the Ethereum blockchain, there's a talk he gave previous to this one about a year ago that I'm linking into the show notes. And if you want to understand more what DeFi is on a, on a, a lower level, I think that's a great talk. In this talk today, we go over the potential applications and many exciting developments in open finance and DeFi. So it's a great opportunity to learn about where there's potential to get involved, where there's potential for really exciting things to happen. And I'm particularly interested in insurance because, you know, you know, F uh, insurance companies. Uh, so. Without further ado, let's get ready to learn and get into listening to Abhi Darshun talk to us about DeFi and open financial markets. Thanks for being on the show. We were just talking before this and we thought like, hey, why don't we just hit record and talk about the subject of learning programming languages? So I, I spent this year learning a language. Uh, you spent time learning languages and we both are basically of the agreement that to lead a team, especially a technical team, it's good to like be able to walk a mile in their shoes and understand the languages. And so we were kind of talking about the languages we we learned. And I was talking about like JavaScript and React for me, and I want to learn Python next. And I think you're learning Python now. And even now, uh, even I believe you're more in like a marketing role and a community driven role. You still do backend, still do Python. And like, it's not like completely out of your system. So I'm just curious, like what's your thought process on people who sit there and they look at like how big you know, learning coding is and how could uh, they get into it? Like using your yourself as a lens for that. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, echoing what we mentioned earlier before this call, I first think the best way to really start learning to code is to sort of start doing projects that really excite you. And my role currently is more as a product manager where I'd say I'm more or less the CEO of my own product. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm responsible for sort of you know, the cross-functional collaboration between our engineers, between our marketers, as well as sort of between our CEO and CEO. That really means that um, for me, I had to go past the initial sort of uh, hurdle in my mind, the mental block that comes when you sort of see, you know, 100 lines of code in your terminal and you're like, wow, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, to then getting guidance and help and support based on my sort of prior background, as well as from my current sort of, you know, technical managers um, to understand how you read code, how you sort of, you know, interpret what's going on and sort of then work on building functions, databases yourself. So that is something that's been really sort of helpful for me. And I definitely say will help anyone else really just like force yourself to um, work on very inspired projects that inspire you and then help you learn from that. Mm -hmm. I, I second this. And then uh, I also think when you're trying to like build the, the building blocks as you test to validate whether or not you have the skills to build what you want to build, um, mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm always a fan of like having a check, like how, like validate that, you know, what, you know, before you move on to the next thing and potentially have like a foundation level issue is try to build like a little game of it. Like there's like so many totally. different, so like I've, I've gone online, I'll, I'll rip like the CSS or HTML of something. Um, mm -hmm. and just like, I'll code up like the underlining stuff of it to make sure I understand like how everything works together. So, you, you know, definitely like have the end goal of what you want to build, but you can, you can kind of like make a modular little simple game that has those concepts in place and it's fun and it's very, uh, you know, it gives you a lot of feedback. Um, and then totally. it, you, you can like test and check that you have the knowledge. I think it also solves 
probably the worst problem for most people, which is like paralysis by analysis. There's just too many languages and places to start from. I feel like if you do something like that, what you said, just inspect out and copy paste your HTML and um, try to play around with the headers and footers. That is a really good suggestion for sure. Yeah, and uh, honestly, I think that uh, with the with the end goal in mind, it's really easy to decide what do you need to know and what do you not need to know. Like, so one thing that I do is I always make a guide. I call it my eighty twenty guide. Uh, I think it's called the Piatro mm -hmm. principle, where it's like right. there's a there's a core twenty percent of things that makes up the eighty percent of impact that you're gonna have. And so after I, as I'm learning something and I build something or I, I will, I'll sometimes watch people code something, I'll look at like, what are the core principles that they're working with? And I'll, mm -hmm. and I'll write out like, these are the core things. This is how they work. I'll even like take screenshots of code and explain it to me. And whenever I run into a problem, I'll add it to the guide and I go through it every couple of days. So I'm getting like that long-term memory sink in. And so mm -hmm. um, when you have that end goal, you can kind of decide what is that 20% for what you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, like. I like I learned JavaScript and React, but I've never like fully built a website because like that's not actually what I'm gonna build. Like I'm building something right. else. Like the website's it's it's not tri not trivial, but it's like it's not towards what I want to be doing. And so like mm -hmm. I put off doing that and I focus on other things. And I think that that helps to your point. Like having an end goal, having a focus thing in mind, because uh, then it gives you like so much direction. It's so easy to say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. What things do you have to learn? And there's so many great tutorials online where you can actually see someone mm -hmm. excitedly talk about how they built it. 100%. Um, I mean, we're also, I like how we're getting into a bit of science of learning and sort of learning methods. Definitely happy to sort of uh, dive deeper into this and could spend hours talking about it. Should probably revisit later in this podcast. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, just a, a, a quick, you know, what are your like tricks uh, for learning? And then we'll, we'll dive into the main topic for today. Sure. Um, I mean, the first thing really is just interleaving practice. Um, and this is something that I don't know about uh, if you have uh, an idea about my educational background, but I went, went to this really um, interesting flipped curriculum program called Minerva for my four years of undergraduate. And we were a small class of 180 students from around 70 different countries. And our program took us to a new country every semester as part of our program. So imagine awesome. study abroad, but every semester. And one unique thing that we had in our program is we have no lectures, no examinations. We have only active seminars where we're supposed to study um, a background level sort of uh, knowledge of the subject or the certain sort of topic we're discussing. So say we're doing statistical inference, we're then sort of having regression and bootstrapping as the task for the class. We have three to four hours of pre-class work where we'd have assignments, we'd have a lot of reading, and we'd probably then look up tutorials as well as sort of coursework and do that as a team together. And then in the class, um, it's very interesting, actually. A professor is not allowed to speak for more than two minutes at a time. There's no lecturing. And what I'm trying to get at is it's only active learning where we all have engaging breakout groups, discussions, and then pre-class polls to test if you can sort of, you know, if you're on the same baseline of knowledge. And then you have sort of a post-class poll to sort of then test what you've learned and sort of what insights you can apply. Um, so I really feel like coming to sort of interleave learning and sort of looking at sort of habits of underlying concepts. Um, I've sort of been tuned to not really, you know, look up lectures or try to, like you said, understand all 100% of what's happening, but rather first get the gist of what the larger goal that I'm trying to solve is and look at what my current state is in terms of the resources I have and then sort of see, you know, what constraints exist and how I can with my limited resources, achieve that goal. So that's always worked out. And I think other things really that help is, you know, no multitasking, if, if sort of uh, possible, that really is a drain on your mental bandwidth at any point. Um, and finally, it's sort of, uh, you know, just like setting um, environments that is conducive to you having a flow state, which I'm really a believer in given I've worked remotely, you know, from every imaginable place um, over the last four years. And one thing that's really hard to master is sort of giving your complete attention and focus regardless of your environment to of the task at hand. So all of this playing together really, really help, I think in the long run for anyone and sort of, you know, um, I think one of the core tenets of success for any person is really just the ability to have an hours focused work of blocks, one block at a time over the course of many years. Really, I think that's that's all you need um, in today's uh, sort of, you know, media frenzied uh, sort of world that we see um, to sort of, just, you know, drive tasks and be clear with your goals. And it's definitely the power of compound interest. And I think uh, Warren Buffett 100%. said it really well, where it's if, uh, learn what compound interest is or um, 
be used by it or something like that. Like if you don't, if you don't use it, it'll like, you'll, you'll be wasted by it because other people will use it and you'll be left behind. Um, if you do something like 10 minutes a day, like it it adds up. If you do 1% better every day, you're three times better by the end of the year. It just has one, you know, like core thing, but I I just want to emphasize this really cool thing that I've noted in my life and other people's lives. As I've uh, advised a lot of startups, talked to a lot of really great people. One of the, like a core principle, that's really great. And I think that the program that you had really instilled this in you is that humility, being able to, you know, like constantly test your assumptions, uh, constantly teach yourself something. It's like, it, it challenges you to, to know, you know, like there's like some people where they get like a little bit of knowledge and they're like, oh, I'm better than everything. And like that immediately right. stunts your potential in terms of what you could see. Cause you always have that block stopping you from seeing it to its full potential to like a kid. So like, there's like this really great uh, parable where um, a magician basically doesn't want to do magic in front of kids. Cause a kid will figure it out. The kids will figure it out in like five seconds. He can't even finish that mm-hmm. magic act before he's like, it's in your thumb. It's in your sleep. Like they just ask every question cause they don't have any uh, filter feeling like, Oh, I'm going to be dumb. If I say this adults, they'll watch the entire thing and not know it because they'll, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll not even think uh, they'll like filter out. They've have a, a habit of filtering out all those things that they perceptually think is a stupid idea of where it could be. And so they try to overanalyze it. So like being really humble and kind of looking at things like a child and then, you know, constantly, uh, you know, finding excuse, uh, finding programs like yours or finding ways in your life where you can kind of like challenge yourself to have that and, and build it as a strength. Cause that is a muscle and, and you, can, 100%. See, you can see it atrophy in other people that get like that, that, that don't challenge themselves. Like they just kind of, uh, I don't know. It, it, it seems kind of sad. They just get like really confident about one thing and they're like, they like stay in that mm-hmm. bubble and then they, they stop growing. Definitely. I mean, I mean, two points here. Um, first point really is there's value in experiencing everything at least once. It really helps you to build a solid opinion versus an impression of what, you know, your opinion might be. And the second thing really, this is related to what you mentioned um, around sort of, you know, building the muscle and sort of having the trough of disillusionment after you reach a peak. Um, that really is always be a student, never a master. And you can sort of, while practicing that motto, um, recognize mastery just coming, like you said, over a compounded period of time. So um, definitely agree. And that's something that um, I sort of, I guess, been humbled by because, you know, we had to travel to like villages in India, Buenos Aires, Argentina, things that I'll sort of, uh, you know, rephrase throughout the sort of podcast where I've been open to sort of, you know, issues of capital controls, domestic violence, you know, financial instability, et cetera, in many different places. Having classmates, you know, who've come from slums in Mongolia, who've come from very, very, you know, interesting, diverse backgrounds and then learning from them. I think that was the difference just because growing up in high school, you know, I never really had that opportunity to get out of my bubble. And I think one of the best things people can really do, especially between their 18 and 25 and their brain and their sort of worldview still maturing is to leave their hometown for a little bit and sort of explore the world from a different lens. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually think this, that's one of the reasons why I thought this uh, topic and uh, as well as our mutual friend recommended you to me um, because you, you've been to so many places, um, you can see the value of Defy and, and you know, you can mm-hmm. see the impact it can have. And so like and there's like the theoretical where you can see like, oh, wow, if right. something gets built, it could have this thing. But I think that you have that unique perspective that you can feel it because you've seen so many people whose lives it will affect. And I, I suspect that's probably like one of the things that gives you so much energy when you, when you're learning about these things where you, I think you started in 2017 and now you're a, a major leader and a company focused on um, innovating in that space. So, I mean, that's a, that's a huge turn over just a couple of years. Certainly. Uh, I mean, I have always been just a, you know, very passionate tinkerer in anything that's been new. I remember, you know, back when I was a kid, when I was nine, 10 years old, um, anytime like I would get a new device. Back then, my parents bought the first ever iPad that had come out. This is, I think, 2010. I jailbroke it the first day because <laughs> I was always very curious and sort of like, you know, um, stripping down a device to its core, understanding what I can add on top of it, what new customizations. I remember back the iPad could never have a cellular function to let you call. But I found this new application that lets you, you know, add a cellular calling device on top. So I've always just been very passionate about like, cutting edge industries and technologies just because I believe that um, that is something where I can always have the most impact in um, just given sort of you're not working on redundant sort of you know point by point improvements but you're rather working on completely zero to one innovations so the story was very interesting you know back in 2017 I just finished a year in San Francisco for my freshman year 
Um, and the whole DeFi craze had not started then because back then all we had, and this is getting into, you know, just like how money has evolved, et cetera, et cetera. We, all we had back then is Bitcoin, which is sort of like this digital gold narrative where, you know, people um, placed value on it give it because of its sort of uh, supply scarcity. So the value proposition there was, you know, you only have 21 million Bitcoin. Um, there's only that much can ever be mined and it's cryptographically sort of verifiable. So, you know, early people who got in and people who sort of over time work on the consensus model that backs and sort of secures network have always been very vocal about, you know, it being future potential federal reserve store of value. So that was sort of what was happening in 2017. I had a roommate back then who sort of, you know, had been very early into whole cryptography and cryptocurrency space who like really dragged me into a hackathon day. And I think that's where I sort of realized that um, this is interesting, not because of what I saw in front of me, but because of back growing up in a small village in India, then moving to the United Arab Emirates and eventually sort of to the US and seeing how open source finance and really like fintech as a concept had not evolved beyond just, you know, improving your user experience or sort of improving one specific business model within traditional finance. And that's when I sort of, you know, came across, I would say red, I was red pilled by Ethereum, which was this open source sort of virtual machine really, where you can build anything on top of it. And the key differentiator here is sort of, you know, first you had Bitcoin, which is sort of this digital gold. Then you had Ethereum, which really, when you compare to money, you would go back to sort of the Sumerian era where the Sumerians, I think this was somewhere around 3,500 BC, were the first civilization in history to really record financial contracts. So what Ethereum as a platform lets you do um, through its inherent nature of being Turing complete. So when something's Turing complete versus when something's Turing incomplete, um, Bitcoin is Turing incomplete because it serves this, this sort of sole purpose of letting you send and receive it and sort of hold it. Um, but when Ethereum is Turing complete, you can really build anything on top of it with no limitations, as long as it's scalable along with the network. And um, back then, you know, we had a very active crypto club in our university as well, given our university is really small. And given we were in San Francisco, um, we were introduced to, you know, wide range of sort of, uh, you know, hackathons, meetups, conferences, et cetera. And I was really just uh, drawn in and I would say almost obsessed back then, almost unhealthily obsessed with the industry. Um, and that sort of one thing led to another. I looked at this very new thing, which currently is really popular called non-fungible tokens. And the concept there was really just uh, solving a lot of issues, um, not just in sort of, uh, you know, Ethereum, because back then Ethereum um, was mo mostly sort of tailored on ICOs. And what ICOs are, are really um, pulled together, bunch of capital, um, and you have this sort of, for the first time in history, you have this system where you can pull together capital in a certain online contract. And this honestly being used for, I would say not the most productive functions because when you have a system like this, it has to game theory there. If you have a system like this where people can sort of, you know, anyone can come up with a contract, it's all anonymous. Um, back then people wanted to raise abnormally high amounts of money for no product just because they could. And one thing led to another and come 2018, come you know, the crash of the ICOs that we've seen, I was really sort of uh, looking for key use cases and areas where we could scale um, sort of down the road. And that's when I sort of chanced upon, you know, the concept of the metaverse. And I realized that there is definitely a future where a lot of digital assets, as well as, you know, identities, um, real estate registries, et cetera, would be registered online or would have to move from its current sort of centralized registries to something that's more openly verifiable. And that's when I sort of um, founded my first company that was called DBay back in 2018 um, in Japan. So we got a seed round there, spent a summer with three of my classmates hacking it together and really sort of, you know, had a great experience learning. Um, we launched a product hunt, grew a lot. Um, and then sort of, you know, come 2018, um, dissolve the company back to our investors because I really felt that crypto was not going anywhere given it was a bear market and there was you know a lack of funding, lack of resources, and a lack of real users who believe in the product. Um, that's sort of you know come two years later, took a break, went to venture capital, um, worked for an AI fund in Canada, worked with Wolfram, with Wolfram Alpha and Wolfram Mathematica on their product. And then uh, lo and behold in 2020, I get a sort of great opportunity to 
um, be part of the first, one of the first companies in this new space of DeFi, where I think the community is sort of within Ethereum, really all you have is a community of developers, a community of people who you'd consider marketers, and you'd have the you know, sort of investor spectrum of people. They'd realize that now you could move from um, vehicles of capital like ICOs, which really are just you know, decentralized funding mechanisms, to then really reimagining financial derivatives that exist on centralized finance on a decentralized finance stack. Um, and what had so far been built were just three products. One was what we'd call a stable coin, which was the MakerDAO DAI stable coin. And what that really is, is it's this algorithmically pegged um, currency where one DAI is always one US dollar. And you have a certain sort of debt position, similar to how a bank would you know, maintain its debt position that ensures that one DAI always one US dollar. But you don't have a certain amount of in a bank vault, you know, stored in gold to collateralize it. But it's rather a very interesting sort of collateralized mechanism. So I sort of started, you know, diving deeper into that. And that's when I realized I was in Argentina in sort of all of 2020, um, stuck there during the pandemic. And I saw the first hand effects of capital controls. In Argentina, they defaulted on an IF uh, debt that they had for the seventh time in the last decade. And what that meant is in January last year, when one US dollar was about 60 pesos, um, by the time I left Argentina in August, one US dollar was 150 pesos. So a policeman on the street who was earning 500 US dollars in January is now only effectively earning 100 to 150 dollars worth in his currency, whereas prices really hadn't changed that much. And that compounded with the government limiting the amount of US dollars that you could own as an Argentinian really made me think and firsthand witness how several Argentinians, as well as people in countries like Turkey, Venezuela, et cetera, where capital controls are an issue, had started this mass exodus of storing their life savings on open source contracts like DAI, where you now have you know, your dollars instantly converted. And there was sort of this proliferation of a whole gig economy around um, people who would help users sort of you know, enter this DeFi ecosystem. Um, one thing led to another from there. This is sort of, you know, the chronological timeline of events. And then you had, you know, derivatives, you had real estate funds, you had, you know, sort of algorithmic pools, a new concept called liquidity pools, where you're sort of taking away what exists in centralized finance called a limit order book, but you completely replace that with sort of a predefined function on code to ensure anyone can really access any fund at any time. And I think the magic of what really started to work got me very into this space. And that's when I joined Zerion, where we've sort of envisioned this future where users would require a non-custodial bank, where custody means, um, you know, they hold the funds for you. But non-custody means we let you sort of access, interact, track, and sort of manage this whole ecosystem of funds um, while you just really use us as an interface, as a beautiful interface that shows you your current net worth, that shows you, you know, equal opportunities to borrow from a certain liquidity protocol, et cetera, et cetera. So I've sort of been doing that from 2010, joined them as their first sort of uh, employee hire. And, you know, really, you really just learned so much being in the space, seeing the space sort of evolve uh, through sort of new complex derivatives being added and also analyzing, you know, um, from a regulatory perspective, um, how regulation is evolved, how you know certain risks are present, and really what opportunities are coming up next. That's sort of just a just you know a pretty long story of how you know what sort of motivated me, got me to where I am through sort of random iterations of trial and error, as well as you know serendipitous moments pe meeting really interesting people along the way. Uh, uh, random trial and errors, uh, how evolution works and look at, look at us. hundred <laughs> percent. So, uh, you mm -hmm. know, cool things can come from that. Uh, I, 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 you ended on regulation. That actually was one of my questions. I'm really curious about how is it possible to regulate, to ensure it's safe. And, uh, you know, especially when, it, you know, as people move more and more of their livelihood, their net worth on a, a DeFi system, how are we able to ensure that there's a standard of safety and how is that kept safe? while it's decentralized. Right, um, so this is a really, really, I would say complex question to answer because you need to look at different levels of analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so right now um, in DeFi, you have everything from, you know, very obscure tokens, quote unquote tokens that anyone can really create because if me and you come together and be like, oh, we're gonna pull together $50,000 in this certain liquidity pool and really try to shill it to every sort of 
person in my town that I know and tell them that it's going to go up. You can technically do that. And that would classify more as an underlying equity risk. So something like an equity risk is always going to be there just because of information asymmetry in a market like this, where users, especially in countries, they don't understand sort of how the technology works, can always be sold something incorrect. And, you know, you've seen that with things like life insurance, you've seen other things like, you know, traditional derivatives, stocks, et cetera, over the course of the years. But I think what's really interesting when you look at the perspective of the smart contract or the technical perspective, now um, this is, there's an increasing trend where in centralized finance, for example, you have, you know, credit rating agencies like Moody's, where they'd be expected to perform the due diligence of sort of, you know, seeing if a certain equity or stock is worthy or is, you know, priced relative to its inherent value. But in DeFi, you have something called smart contract auditing firms, where you have really robust um, teams of ethical white hat hackers, as I would call them, um, testing um, a certain protocol or a certain self-driving bank, which is what a protocol is, um, to any point of failure. So you're really just testing for black swan events. Like for example, if the collateral ratio of what underlies a MakerDAO protocol goes below a certain level, would that depeg the die to make it sort of now not be a single dollar anymore? Those would be examples of how you'd explore it from an economic perspective. And then you have the technical perspective where um, there's risks around things like you know reliance on a centralized oracle. You have something called a price oracle in DeFi where um, a lot of these um, protocols don't just get their sources of prices from like a you know, centralized API because that is not centralized. You have a decentralized system where an article really just um, lets you connect a real world price feed. So say you wanna own an S&P 500 stock, but you're you know, in a small village in Pakistan, you could now do that for synthetic S&P 500 stock, but the synthetic S&P 500 stock would be connected to a centralized, would be connected to an Oracle. And there's a risk that this Oracle could be malfunctioning, thereby leading to a difference in the actual synthetic assets price. So that is another sort of, uh, I would say, a level where um, we have gone a long way in improving and being better how, about how oracles work. But um, in terms of sort of the final, you know, the protocol level, the community level, um, there's a, several social trust and community-based verification systems that have come about to really fill this uh, gap of needing, you know, um, sort of understanding for you or for anyone as a new user, um, how you can sort of uh, navigate the space. And for this, you know, even for us, Zerion, we've done this thing where you have something called a token list where there's currently 20 different leading providers in the space. And these would be sort of the leading decentralized banks we would see. You have Uniswap, which is sort of like a automated market maker. So they really function as a settlement layer. There are us indices. So what a token list is, um, is sort of this um, hybrid centralized and decentralized way of us to vet and source certain contracts of tokens. Coming back to what I said earlier on how anyone can really create any derivative they want and how anyone can connect into this composable money Lego layer of how DeFi works. Um, there's this need for us to sort of vet and verify and do this as a community together in terms of having you know, derivatives standardized. We haven't really seen this in anything really um, in Web2 internets, in like traditional finance. And this has come about where this has really helped out. If you go to Zerion, for example, you see a blue tick um, next to a certain asset or next to a certain sort of derivative. Um, and that means that it's sort of verified on two or more of these token lists. So this is an example from a more product perspective. Um, and how does all of this, I would say, tie to regulation? Um, that is a more sort of, uh, I would say, interesting question to answer just because this is very much reminiscent of the early internet days where you had things like copyright wars. How would you determine if code is law? If person who coded something, say you code a financial smart contract, and tomorrow there is $20 billion of value locked into it, which is not unusual because right now the total value locked as collateral into DeFi has just $800 billion for the first time ever. And this stood at about hundred million dollars a little over a year back. And that's a phenomenal growth. So how do you treat, you know, theories of secondary liability? How do you treat copyright in terms of someone copy pasting a protocol you've created and then creating a fork as we would call it, which could improve upon it with a very small sort of percentage change 
but immediately they capture more greater market share because as a user, you have no switching costs. And all you really do is connect your sort of wallet or connect your on-chain identity to some of these platforms. So questions like that, we really still, I would say at a very early stage of organizations like the CFTC, the Office of the Comptroller, the Federal Reserve, trying to wrap their heads around this and form frameworks. Um, but when you look at things like, um, how do you sort of you know, create and engage with the DeFi community? There's been a lot of uh, progress done there. There's this you know, fund like the DeFi Alliance Fund where most of the Ivy League universities and research institutions in the US, including you know, Harvard, Stanford, the Office of the Comptroller and the Federal Reserve, um, sort of pull together their capital and have a decentralized way of governing what happens for certain rules. So you have progress being made, I would say, from the academic or from the more sort of research level there. Um, but what's sort of nice to see is in, in Europe, in the UK, and in the US, you also have organizations um, trying to sort of out um, federal level, I would say, um, you know, uh, organizations researching, you know, what would a centralized CBDC, a central bank digital currency look like? Um, what would the sort of the UK's FCA, for example, they legalized um, the creation of certain open source liquidity protocols. So they give you a license, um, you know, for protocols like Aave, which is currently the largest money market protocol, um, where now with the license, you can not only sort of, you know, conduct this with any XYZ individual around the world, but you can also now tap into institutional sources of liquidity because what you have is essentially an audited open source ledger that does certain functions. So across the board, I really think we're, you know, at least two to five years out from very fundamental tax regulations, very fundamental, you know, jurisdictional regulations, as well as institutional regulations from coming in. What we really have um, is a larger acknowledgement from all parties involved at multiple levels that this cannot be regulated like centralized finance just because A, you have new forms of instruments that don't even exist in centralized finance. You know, what is the instant sort of, you know, magic loan? What are things that you know, comprise five different transactions matched into one because you can do that in a blockchain? You don't really have current regulatory frameworks in finance to deal with that. So we are at least two to five years out from aspects like that um, sort of being clarified. And from what I, what I hear from legal counsel in the space, um, the real notion here is similar to how the internet came about. You know, people are always in the 1990s asking, you know, why do you need email? Why do you need, you know, um, sort of uh, websites and e-commerce when, you know, this is really slow, it's cumbersome, the fees are too high, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the internet companies, especially those based in Silicon Valley and somewhere else, they really just were funded to the point where, you know, they built the product market fit. And they sort of took advantage of feedback loops that eventually sort of just brought down the cost of capital for them, as well as just introduce economies of scale. And I see that happening currently, uh, given we've seen a year and a half into what I'd call DeFi. And now the DeFi movement is really moving into this Web3 movement, which is uh, sort of capturing the internet of value. Web2 was really just like, you know, now you can self-create content, you can you know, post anything you want, you have social media networks, you have Reddit, you have you know, all these platforms where the platform owns your content, but now you're moving into a broader Web3 sort of feedback loop where you have self-sustained decentralized organizations, which we'd call DAOs, you have the money markets, which is like DeFi, so it's decentralized Wall Street, and then you have sort of decentralized art networks of people pulling their sort of capital together as well as their art together. And that is sort of what you see in the NFT space. And this is a very cyclical market for sure. For the long term of, you know, five to 10% of players who would sustain and sort of build to become the behemoth industry would certainly sort of, you know, form a new class of their own. And that's sort of, you know, where um, regulation as a large level sort of lies at, 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 as of the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it um ma makes sense. The uh, the a question I have, and I think I don't know if there's an answer to it, but it, it uh, originally uh, as an economic model, we had like a gold standard where like a dollar was worth like X amount of gold or whatever. Right. And we went to a Keynesian economic model, and FDR FDR and his secretary were like, "Yeah, let's do this." And everyone was, like half of people were like, "Don't do that. That's stupid." Don't go to Keynesian right. economics, but Keynesian economics is one of the reasons that, you know, I think that and like half the world was on fire at that point, like why America was able to grow so fast after, um, 
World War II. So I'm curious if this like DeFi represents like the, like the next iteration of the continuation from gold standard to Keynesian to like the next economic model. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I'll start from at least what's seen as the argument from within the DeFi community. And then I'll say sort of my own perspective. So the DeFi community's argument really here is, I mean, Nixon, you know, famously unpegged the gold standard, I believe sometime around 1971, President Nixon. And that has essentially led to, you know, the US dollar being, uh, I would say sort of uh, argument around the Federal Reserve being able to print a lot more money um, at, uh, to sort of balance, you know, their fiscal uh, deficits and sort of, you know, ensure sort of monetary policy there. Um, and the argument from um, sort of where crypto economics as a new class of economics is going is more or less that um, you can really pull together any agents or group of stakeholders um, where they assign the value um, based on sort of programmed levels of scarcity or programmed levels of inflation. So you have things like bonding curves that have been used in traditional economics. You have things around, you know, um, introduce scarcity for specie goods. And that's what you saw with traditional currencies. And the sort of argument here really is that it's unsustainable um, given how, for example, the Federal Reserve printed 25% of all money ever printed over the course of last year. Of, you know, further fund the money printer go brewer, as we talk, as we call it, um, to sort of keep this as a sort of uh, stable, or at least as a, you know, inflationary economics um, does really work in crypto because this is sort of completely different. Um, and you have economic models underlying pretty much every XYZ protocol I talked that work independently for themselves. Um, but the long-term goal is all of these protocols, there is no competition. It's more collusion because when one protocol, um, it's network, you know, when a lending protocol or a stable coin protocol comes about, now you have more capital um, that can be used for other purposes where, you know, there's a real estate protocol where, for example, if you're, you know, a person in India, you can now real estate with 20,000 other people in a property in Miami and get on-chain sort of uh, earnings in terms of rent every month, along with interest. Because the protocol's earnings is automatically rebalanced into a global liquidity pool that's earning a certain amount of interest. And the spreads are much higher because you don't have a middleman or a bank controlling them. So really what I'm trying to get at is um, we're seeing uh, new forms of economic models depending on the type of asset or the class of derivative you're looking at. That is in the sort of narrow picture. In the broader picture, why companies, you know, share, companies of uh, shareholdings or why, you know, we've had uh, occasions where when it, I, I believe it was El Salvador who, you know, sort of um, made Bitcoin as a digital reserve currency, or you have companies like Tesla um, and Elon Musk himself owning a bit of Bitcoin, a bit of Ethereum, et cetera, in his personal holdings. The real sort of uh, reason there is, you know, inflation is expected at seven to 10 percent every year. Um, the currency is expected to devalue, at least not the US dollar, but if you look at places like India, Venezuela, like pretty much, you know, a lot of other third world countries, currencies are expected to sort of, you know, over time um, devalue. Um, then you have this argument that you have a currency like Ethereum or a currency like Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is scarce, Ethereum is actually deflationary. So the amount of issuance of Ethereum de sort of deflates and reduces every year. And since it's a utility commodity, the more Ethereum is used to power such decentralized apps, the more sort of uh, scarce it really becomes. And that is where you get into this very interesting game theory of model of programmed ponzi nomics, where you would call it. And that, that is different for uh, sort of newer NFTs, some of the newer hype protocols that you see. But broader trends, I would always say this would exist as a sort of um, class of assets on its own mm -hmm. um, existing on Web3, but something like Keynesian economics that you see with traditional fiat currencies, they would mostly, you know, a decade from now or a couple of decades from now, sort of migrate onto maybe a central bank digital currency, where now you'd have the same benefits of anonymity of something like using cash, but you'd have, you know, double-sided protection, you'd have additional sort of, uh, um, you know, tax efficiency that are from the government's perspective. So it makes more sense for them to migrate their existing sort of fiat currency to something like a CBDC. And this will exist on this metaverse layer or this sort of internet layer, as we'll see. And really something like, you know, how uTorrent or the Tor browser came about, they didn't capture value because they were really used more for letting you transfer any amount of, you know, illicit information, goods, sort of text over the internet in a way that was not traceable or hackable from the government. 
But with DeFi, what's different is really, um, you know, helping you um, sort of build this open source programmable money layer that no one can stop. And I think there's a reason why even smart investors like, you know, Warren Buffett or Schaller might um, not see the value in this right now, just because it's hard to really um, fathom um, a concept of extra sovereign money that's programmable and native to the internet. And I feel like that is where this lives in. And it sort of builds its own class of economics where you can really define what sort of, you know, certain protocol or certain money market would work based on. And it's up to the market and it's up to the users and users who dictate, you know, which ones over time sustain and what sort of capital market model is the most efficient. And that's why we'd say something, you know, cap the capital is so free flowing in the market and yields are really high just because you don't have any middlemen. And there are aspects around that. And there's also institutional interest now where, um, you know, we have probably like the, the interest of traditional VCs in crypto VCs or in crypt opening crypto funds is an all time high. And the number of banks testing interbanking settlement layers, I think 75 out of the top 100 banks in the world are currently testing interbank settlement layers on an open source platform like Ethereum. Visa uses USDC, which is a USD coin, a stable coin in Ethereum, just because they're seeing there's definitely possibilities to operate as a traditional company with a regulated framework. But as part of your offering, have this sort of internet native layer of sort of you know capital to sort of do certain functions and do that maybe even at a cost or at a regulatory sort of uh, um, way that's easier and less hassles for them. So there's aspects like that as well. And that's why I think overall, um, from a more traditional economic or academic perspective, you have to sort of see the entire picture to understand that this is, this can't be categorized into one specific model of economics. And there's a lot of interlaying sort of parts. That makes sense. It, it'll, it's like a, it's like a portfolio of economics going on at the same time versus like yeah. and eventually like kind of a, a slow co-evolution of the different models into something that could come right. next. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious yeah. though, what have you thought about this? Like, have you given any like thought about sort of, you know, where the economic model of, uh, you know, crypto or something in general with open finance is going towards? And um, if so, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. I, I'm I'm curious what the what do, I have a lot of questions. I don't have a lot of conclusions. Right. <laughs> so like I, I'm at this I'm, I'm at the stage. I think most things have like a, a caterpillar type stages mm -hmm. to it. Like you're in the beginning, you're like a larva and you just eat a ton of stuff, and then you get to the chrysalis form where you synthesize down so you can emerge as a butterfly that does something constructive. And I'm definitely at that mm -hmm. like engorging phase where I have so many questions. Like, um, you know what. What, what, you know, added benefits does like an end user have for using DeFi over centralized? Like, does it, does it uh, decrease the chances of fraud, stuff like that? I'm, I'm very mm -hmm. curious. I also like, like related, but unrelated, because uh, I know it's not finance per you know, but I'm curious if there's like a way to meld like insurance with DeFi as uh, mm -hmm. a way to, cause I hate insurance companies. They piss me off. So like, if there was, <laughs> like, right. it's just like a general thing. So I have a lot of uh, curiosity. I have a lot of uh, uh, things that I wonder about. If there's like a way to make like a like a like a global bank that everyone can kind of tap into, and you know, you can imagine if especially if if I'm understanding right, it's kind of like a global pool, um, right? So like someone in there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool economic journals coming out where people make these micro loans to people in Africa or developing nations, and or like, even mm -hmm. like um, will. Uh, set them up with like chickens or, or uh, Herfer International does this where they set up like chickens. It becomes like a little economic boom where it affects like it like really quickly can affect an entire village of people, even if they uh, target a couple of families. Right. And so I'm curious, mm -hmm. like how, like not just not trickle down or trickle up, but like how that could work to allow like a, a person who wants to be an entrepreneur that was born right. in, you know, uh, you know, a, a developing com uh, co uh, country tapping into that, right. uh, using that to leverage, to build something locally that benefits their community, which then uplifts that entire community, something, something greater. I'm curious, like, I'm generally curious to, if that is po possible and then like, how would that mm -hmm. accelerate eliminating poverty from the world? Cause the, over the last couple of decades, poverty's got like, it's, it's getting to the point where like, there's very few 
relative to history, poor people on the planet. Right. So I'm curious, like, right. uh, so and I'm answering your question, like a lot of things I'm curious about. And it comes, there's one thing that like, like underpins like this thought that I'm saying now, which is um, like in the U in the U S just as one, cause like most people think all oh, the U S like it's a developed country. There's, I mean, that has lots of problems, but you get to see them on CNN, but um, like <laughs> the, Fox News, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, 22% <laughs> of our children don't get the food they need to develop healthily. So like, what's that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, on average kids who don't get a, a meal, you know, that's 22%, 13 million uh, kids in the U S will lose mm-hmm. about 10 to 20 IQ points. So mm-hmm. every generation and it's getting, it's gotten smaller over time, but like, you know, even now, if you consider that the smallest 13 million, 22%. So one in four of our generation is losing. And I think the average IQ is hundred. So like every generation, mm-hmm. a third of uh, a fourth of our, our generation are losing, you know, a fourth of their IQ. Like, how does that affect the impact of our innovation? And then you extrapolate that mm-hmm. for the whole world that has a lot of food insecurity. Mm-hmm. And then you, you mm-hmm. can see that uh, effects on children and effects on if, if, if everyone had what they needed in terms of food, just as an example. And if you could mm-hmm. uh, kind of like had like a, a global pool that allow you to leverage, to build things in your community, which would then, mm-hmm. uh, I assume, I would hope, uh, uplift those communities. So there would be less poverty then right. you, could, you could just see the impact like within one generation of everyone having the full potential and the full ability mm-hmm. to tap into the the global, um, not just economy, but like the web, the web, everything. Those are my thoughts. Mm-hmm. Those are things I think about. There's, there's more. I, I don't think I answered your question though. But that's awesome. No, I mean, this, this also brings a lot of points to rely on, right? Um, because there's a bunch of different insights I have. I just spend this together now so I can sort of, you know, capture what you talked about. One, um, what really is banking? And banking is really just an IOU sort of like from a bank, which is a account, which is a larger organization that exists to, you know, put equity or capital to good use and make money off your spread, right? So in that sense, all they do is really move, your, move a bunch of numbers on their back end um, to help you get what you want. And in that sense, really, um, what I see here coming to sort of, you know, equality of opportunity and all of that, in, in developed countries, you have things like credit rating agencies that really try to like make opportunity more transparent. And in developing countries, it's about, you know, who you know, or what sort of muscle you have in your village or town or sort of city to get access to resources. With DeFi, um, this is something that I tell to everyone. Once you try to really use one of these D apps, as I call them, decent applicants, where you could take a low um, using existing assets as collateral. So say you're someone in Venezuela and you just have, you know, you store your life savings of thousand dollars and you now want to do something. You have collateralized loans and you even have something like an under collateralized zones where you can just, you know, put up a certain amount for your loan. And since it's all on a smart contract, it's almost like an escrow where everything is digitally verifiable. No one knows who your name is. You have no email accounts, nothing. It's all completely anonymous, no KYC needed. And you're able to sort of do that in the current iteration. So for equality of opportunity to be available, the first thing it really there is access to financing should not be discriminated. And in that sense, this is the first step ever where you don't need to be interviewed by a bank or you don't need to sort of show up in a certain way to sort of get finance as a function to be sort of happening. So that was the first thing I had in mind. The second thing around insurance, they're already very, very interestingly, you know, in a centralized market, you have something like the FDIC um, that, you know, is there as an organization created by the government to ensure that in the case of a black swan event or in terms of systemic risk, you know, you get out your money. But in DeFi, what's interesting is two points. One, there is no systemic risk because a lot of times a certain protocol is not directly systemically endemic to another protocol. And and, and in terms of like nothing in one protocol going wrong can necessarily break another protocol because a lot of these sort of function necessarily as if then functions on the blockchain in terms of code that a programmer has developed. And what you have with insurance is very interesting. So, you know, how would a traditional insurance mutual work? You have, you know, people, maybe pension funds, large investors pulling together a bunch of capital. You have actuaries making the risk models and the sort of models on how risky certain classes of tiers or tranches would be. And then you have people buying premiums or premiums to get a certain insurance, right? Now, how would this sort of go? This is more of a thought experiment of how you would, you know, in this hypothetical scenario of having open source capital, 
how would you build this on chain? Um, you would do the same thing. You just have algorithmic actual terms. You'd have a way for people to purchase a mutual um, if they want a certain you know position to be insured. And then you'd have people who want to be part of governance of this mutual or this protocol itself. And the interesting thing is this exists. You have you know, mutuals like Nexus Mutual, which is an on-chain insurance derivative. And I believe as of today, they have you know over $500 million of locked-in value where there are people taking completely decentralized sort of almost like insurance premiums on their current positions to ensure that in the event of a certain contract risk or in the event of a certain sort of risk, depending on the terms of insurance, um, you will get compensated. So what's interesting here is, you know, this is just the first iteration where you only have two or three of these protocols really functioning along. But as this gets, space gets more uh, evolved with innovative use cases, there's a more scalable and secure sort of retail ready insurance products currently being built on. And examples of, you know, companies are, you know, Andreessen Horowitz recently, they released, uh, you know, large, I believe, two, um, Two billion dollar fund, yes, two billion dollar fund for crypto, and a large portion of their fund is also going towards a lot of the um, companies solving problems and you know access in insurance. And really, one big tenet that they have, and which is something I very much agree with, is investing in companies that use crypto or DeFi under the hood. But as an end user, you don't realize it's crypto or DeFi. And an example of what's happening here is what we'd call play to earn. So there's this game called Axie Infinity. Um, you know, founders are great friends. They're a company that started two years to around two years back, I believe, uh, late 2017. And essentially, the core uh, sort of purpose of the game it's sort of like Pokemon, where you can trade some you know uh, cool characters, but you also play in a battle. And they have an economic model where you know the founder was in town recently. We sort of started playing the game because the, he gave me a scholarship. So to start playing the game, you need um, a certain amount of funds but now there are entire villages in the philippines you have entire towns around the world and the game has grown to a market cap of 80 billion dollars where it's a self-sustaining economy of people actually quitting their full-time incomes because they lost their job during the pandemic or because you know they just didn't have other meaningful sources of income in very very third world developing countries and earning anywhere between 200 to 500 dollars a month playing a game like this because you can sort of like almost have this open economy. Like why do Fortnite skins go for so much? I believe they have over a billion dollars of trading volume every month um, because a gaming developer sort of can accrue all the value and because there's enough demand from users who play it to sort of use that. Similar to that, you have these ecosystems where not even considering DeFi, you have play to earn games. You have, you know, the sort of loan aspect of what I talked about. And then you have something that's very interesting called community currencies. A colleague of mine um, piloted the first ever RCT, the first ever randomized control trial um, in, I believe, Ghana, um, where along with the local economic foundation there and the government, they did this experiment of, you know, distributing a certain amount of stable coins to certain villages and seeing if that changed spending patterns, where now these villagers themselves who were previously not onboarded to traditional banks, so there's over 1.8 billion unbanked people in the world currently, could now access you know, very interesting instruments like open savings protocols, giving you upwards of 5% savings rates per year. You could you know, have um, sort of, un, 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 you could have access to like pooled liquidity sources where sort of like what you mentioned earlier, if there's an entrepreneur in a village or a town who wants to build a certain idea, um, you can totally see a future where like like how we have websites today and like how the internet modularized and sort of reduced the barrier for creating products and increased the supply of these products. Um, there could be a few where, the, where finance as a sort of like a tenant of human value is really modularized. And all you'll see is a bunch of these drag and drop, you know, products that you can create by yourself and set your own values and sort of and let the functions do their own job. And this would be examples of, you know, pulled together mutuals, no loss lotteries, which is also really interesting. You have something called a loss lottery, where there's an example of a company called Pull Together, where every week you have sweepstakes. In a traditional lottery, you know, you're, you, you might have people in your town who participate in lotteries. You go to a um, local grocery store or a convenience store, buy a lottery ticket, and then you sort of, the, the cost you pay for entering the sweepstakes is the lottery ticket cost you paid. But in something like a decentralized no-loss lottery, um, you know, say there's a $5 million pool of capital from 100,000 different people just putting in a small amount each um, over a period of one month, 
how is no loss of these workers, that sort of pool of capital is automatically rebalanced into an open liquidity pool mm. that's then providing value for others to borrow or lend from. So by the end of the month, the, the price for the lottery is the interest earned on that, which is significant enough and everyone else gets their capital back. So it's a no loss lottery that's mm. actually providing instant capital that initially only accredited investors or, you know, Morgan Stanley or investment banks with their certain sort of tranches of divisions would be able to do. So these are, um, you know, just specific case studies um, showcasing, you know, over the last one year, how you've had um, something like this come up. But what's really interesting to note is just how DeFi is inherently global, right? That's something that people don't think much about. Um, you know, I talk to users, developers, builders, founders every day from every walk of life from all around the world just because they're like, oh, once I started using DeFi, it just seems so absurd to me to go to a bank, wait, you know, for a day to get a wire transfer to write on this document, do something that we currently see as normal just because that's the norm and how like money is moved around. But then we realized, oh, you can actually have something much more efficient, um, even in its most broken initial form that it is today. Uh, it just makes more intuitive sense that there will be more value accrual in something like this down the road. And then you think about another insight, which is you know, most of the world today um, might have you know, capital in age brackets of sort of you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s, that age group. But then you have current teenagers, people in you know, 20s, et cetera, who are born up sort of with this internet native generation. And you know, people who sort of have Ethereum wallets and on-chain wallets before even being 18 and being eligible for a bank account. So when you have a sort of broader shift in how people perceive these instruments, um, you're really seeing that being sort of a bigger catalyst for, I would say, reducing um, economic inequality, at least in the longer run. And another very interesting point here is something I was talking to a friend earlier, um, was we've never ever in history had this many rich, young crypto entrepreneurs who basically made millions in their 20s or even in their teens through sort of the, through capitalizing on the early stage of the current S-curve that we are in. Um, and it's interesting to think about, you know, just as a thought experiment, the long-term implications of what would mean to have so much capital. I'm talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of capital in an early sort of age group where you could look at things like, you know, anti-aging research. You could look at things like psychedelics. You could look at things like, you know, economic sort of, you know, reforms. You could look at a lot of different things. There's aspects where the sort of ripple effects and sort of what we talked about earlier, the compounded effects of, you know, having capital, having, you know, a larger mission and having a value of really solving the geographical lottery of finance that you currently have in terms of where you're born up, uh, where you were born sort of, um, dictates the access to financial resources that you have. I feel like all of this together are just sort of a, um, almost like a perfect storm um, for the bullish market that you see today. And that's why you have a lot of investors as well as people very interested in this space. But long-term, obviously yields are not always gonna be high. The market is always not gonna be very exciting. You will eventually have a convergence, like I mentioned earlier, of sort of the Web3 native internet of value where you'd certainly have companies taking advantage of, you know, their huge treasuries being built on top of this and maybe not having the most ethical CSR practices. You'll have a lot of examples of things that come out that, you know, would be similar to the dot-com boom and the dot-com bust right after. But uh, there will be an innovation that, you know, will lead to easier global remittances that will lead to better access to any instrument you want. And that will finally lead to sort of, you know, pooled capital of resources just being more transparent. Like in India, you have things like, you know, land grabs where anyone could go and, you know, through their political cloud, uh, literally claim that your land is theirs because, you know, they have sort of changed the legal registry on what's, you know, existing in a book in the government. And now imagine that, you know, decades from now being to a blockchain, a non-fungible legal registry that can never be tampered and can, that can never sort of, you know, be changed. Whether it will be on the blockchain in the way it currently is, I don't know. But whether that is a zero to one innovation that will solve a ton of issues, both in terms of inequality and fraud we have today, is pretty positive. So uh, that is really just the sort of uh, way I would say the entire industry is evolving. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I always wonder, you know, if you open up a, a lens into the future 
and uh, you imagine what it could be, you know, where are we going? And it, and it kind of mm-hmm. sounds like, especially if you can uh, uh, earn a living in a virtual world, that it's kind of like a, a ready player one situation coming up a little bit where right. you can kind of have like the Oculus. I don't know if you ever saw that movie or read the book. It's pretty good. I recommend I did. it. I did. Okay, the movie yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Uh, books, books good too. I don't think they leave anything out uh, from the book. I think the movie's actually probably better than the book, which is really weird. I think it might be one of those right. rare cases. But um, so I guess just as like a like a, a quick aside, like how do you see with your perspective, like is it a Star Trek? Is it a Ready Player One? Is it a, like a, an amalgam? Like how do you see the future if you could use like a, a nerd reference to, to illustrate it? Right. Um, so I would say maybe on the gaming side of things or the sort of more, you know, collectible entertainment media side of things, it would only be more like Ready Player One. Just because, I mean, that came out before COVID, right? I remember watching it in March last year, right before the pandemic hit. And I was like, wow, this is such a cool hypothetical scenario. Everyone being stuck indoors and having to be forced to sort of spend their lives online. And then that happened to us. So for me, I see a lot of aspects of what they portrayed in terms of, you know, in-game, like sort of trading, having a lot of your value of, you know, what you've earned. I think there was a boxing match or something in the movie where um, you sort of get a certain um, reward for winning it. Um, I see a lot more entertainment or sort of day-to-day, um, you know, art or sort of music, royalties, etc., accruing to maybe more of a non-fungible token or something like a Web3 native art layer. That's something that is still very early. And I saw that sort of building my previous startup. But for something like um, DeFi, it's really hard to say um, because there, I think, doesn't exist any core, you know, media reference or something that will really allude to what uh, is happening right now. Maybe if there was a movie that suddenly showed, you know, 1.8 billion people around the world suddenly getting access to some, you know, internet native money and then revolting against masses and creating their own system, maybe that would be a cool movie. But I, I, like. Um, anything like you have movies like the big shot which show like you know instances of um, catastrophic systemic failures in centralized finance um so i feel like if anything this really um is showcasing something that is becoming you know uh, the opposite of the very opposite of something like the big shot because then it was only like one or two people who had like information preferential access to something that they didn't really see that was happening so much um but in something like crypto you know a, the smartest people work in crypto. I have people, you know, I see I, people who work with me are people who, you know, left cushy jobs in investment banking and big tech. A, you know, they're probably like a 50 plus year old, like grandfather who is now seen, who's worked in finance for 20, 30 years and now seen sort of the other side. You have, you know, the most smart, talented hackers, programmers, etc. cetera. Um, so anything, this would be this hypothetical movie of, um, people who parlayed their early childhood interests of sci-fi, gaming, like programming, browsing, et cetera, and anything really related to computers into real world decentralized applications. And this sort of, you know, might even at a certain point appeal to their libertarian values and anarchy sensibilities. I feel like I'm making a movie plot at this point because like imagine this plot where, you know, all these computer savvy individuals come together and uh, they sort of pioneer, build, develop, open source stack of web three applications, smart contracts, cryptocurrencies, et cetera. And finally, like the movie or the plot of this TV show or the series would end with, you know, this either this utopia of the internet being this integrated world without frontiers or this dystopia of the integrated, like people who aren't able to catch up to this integrated world or people who've, you know, still been operating web two world, people whose jobs have not been, you know, uh, have been automated, et cetera. Um, not being able to catch up for them, it would be a very dystopian sort of vision. So um, that is something that I would say, like, you know, just now that we've sort of answered the question, I would say that is definitely um, something that, you know, me being in this space every day, I have a vested sort of interest in ensuring that, you know, we uh, responsibly grow and don't sort of uh, spread the burden of, you know, such fast progress onto people who aren't even involved in the industry. And I think that's something where I'm actually very glad to see how, you know, until last year, you know, crypto has been around for 10 years. Traditional finance has never really batted an eyelid, but now um, the number of calls and sort of opportunities I have to talk to people, you know, be it traditional finance funds, pension funds, asset management firms, um, 
it seems like almost having a 5% or 10% exposure in your overall portfolio to instruments like this is starting to become the norm. And that's what you had early on with tech stocks or, you know, high growth stuff. So it's sort of becoming its own category of things. Um, so related to Ready Player One or sort of anything, you know, sci-fi, um, that could very, very much be a future where, um, you know, this is integrated into our lives without us knowing that it's crypto under the hood. It's just the internet or it's just, you know, an on-chain system that's a database that's verifiable by everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, we could make a movie and call it like DeFi or something. Um, DeFi, totally. Yeah, and I yeah. mean, on that, I have a book recommendation called The Infinite Machine. So The Infinite Machine was, you know, pretty much just a, a geochronological, very exciting storyline of everything I mentioned um, in the last four years, you know, starting from Switzerland, you know, it's, it's sort of like based in every city around the world and talks about the um, sort of like the day-to-day -day, um, evolution of how DeFi has become what it is now, you know, everything from the starting of Ethereum, regulatory troubles they had to go through back then as a team of, you know, four people and a decentralized collective of like, you know, people around the world validating the network and trying to register in Switzerland. And it was written by this journalist called Camilla Arudo, who used to work at Bloomberg and now has the largest DeFi native uh, sort of uh, media company. So it's interesting and um, could definitely make a ton of different movie thoughts out of it. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, have to check that out. But I also think um, to echo your last point before moving on to the next question, um, mm -hmm. like if you look at someone like Mark Cuban as, as an example, I think it was like three or four years ago where he was saying, you know, deep, stay out of this stuff. It's like a, right. like chintzy pop. And now he's he's been very right. uh, almost like an active uh, an activist saying like, hey, you know, it's it's pretty good, you know, based on your risk profile and stuff to have like a component, of, like you're saying, like 5% or whatever your portfolio um, mm -hmm. in it. And uh yeah, there's some like fun ones too, like Dogecoin, which is like just fun. Uh, but right. you know, is, uh, so I, I see the evolving landscape. I'm, I'm so I have like a, a question. There's like it's like two, but I'm gonna meld it into one because I think they're kind of related. Um, I'm curious, is it possible for like a, like a hostile agent or government um, to manipulate or or a negatively affect DeFi? And then like how does let's you know assuming like a 2008, uh, you know, s crash were to happen, how is the consumer like the like people like you and me, if we're if we're using this these systems, right. protected or are we protected or how could how could we protect it? So I guess they're like similar, uh, but like different at the same time. Right, um, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, for the first part of the question around the government really trying to regulate it, I would say the broader answer is no because it's trying to like shut down the internet as an analogy of trying mm. to shut down DeFi or an open source infrastructure. But you can definitely make amends in your current regulatory infrastructure to make certain aspects of DeFi or at least the users of these protocols, you know, disincentivized to use them. Um, something as an example, you know, the recent US infrastructure bill by Biden, um, they, I think at the end, a couple of senators added an amendment that technically made uh, certain types of protocols that use a certain consensus mechanism, proof of stake mechanisms, um, uh, liable to additional taxes. So something like this, would not necessarily affect the user directly and it would not you know curtail the growth of the overall infrastructure layer but what it would lead to is offshoring offshoring of talent offshoring of companies from the us offshoring of you know user bases from here to sort of maybe more concentrated in asia or other countries where a certain government is more sort of willing to invest in sort of safe harbor clusters or sort of, you know, uh, I would say broader monitoring sort of schemes for such tools. So the offshoring aspect is something that is very inherent because most people working in DeFi, like myself, do not, you know, either have bank accounts, like we are what we would classify bankless because you can now have complete infrastructure. I can have a debit card or a credit card that's completely in based on my stable coins and you have infrastructure from Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, around that. So there is a need there where, you know, there's beyond a certain point, not a possibility to curtail or ban or sort of, um, I would say even like uh, try to monopolize or mobilize a certain, uh, you know, level of control. So there's no real fiscal policy or monetary policy influence that can do that. That was to answer the first question. Um, something around systemic risks. So this is, uh, I would say a point that I actually wrote an entire dissertation on. I'm mm. happy to share that with your audience later. Um, mostly around, you know, breaking down sort of the infrastructure into the technical security risks, the economic security risks, analyzing from a larger framework, what would cause a sort of, you know, catastrophic 
um, failure or systemic, you know, sort of market run or bank run, as we would call that. Um, and as of now, really, um, I talked about some of this earlier. The largest systemic risk that exists is just collateral and sort of the narrative of DeFi, or because a lot of these markets are narrative driven. Um, currently, the S and P five hundred is at its all time high. I think they've hit all time highs like every other week this year. Stock market, the sort of crypto market, every market concealed, the real estate market, everything's at an all time high. So the systemic risk right there is everything is correlated right now in terms of how you know broader monetary policy from the government in the U.S. has made stocks go up, which has made a bunch of other things go up, which has eventually led to this current interest in non low yield bonds because bonds are also sort of at all time low. So that is a systemic risk where, you know, current change or reversal in bond yields, which might cause people to pull out from crypto, which might cause people to pull out from like, you know, equities more or reallocate their portfolios in the bigger picture will cause, you know, a movement of few billions or trillions of dollars out of crypto. But that aside, there is no systemic risk to, you know, one protocol being hacked. Like a protocol can still be hacked where there could be a certain function it's like programming where if, if you don't program your you know uh, css and html properly you will have you know scripts sort of all over the place and you can't see your website properly similar to that if you don't account for all vulnerabilities in the protocol that you program and it's not audited well enough and you don't have people sort of auditing it and you're vulnerable to bugs in code but you're not vulnerable to like a certain protocol completely going down unless it's an Oracle protocol or something that powers the many different protocols on top of it. Because what happens at the end of the day is a user might lose their money on their protocol because it's collateralized. But if they have an insurance derivative, they're insured. And, and this market is evolving to a point where now you have you know, larger fintechs, you have Venmo, you have um, PayPal, you have Robert, who are testing these you know, crypto settlement layers as well as that you buy and sell crypto. I feel like the longer term there is they will absorb a lot of that systemic risk just because they are what, at the end of the day, powers most of the mass market audiences. And the, the sort of vetted protocols and ones that at the end of the day actually serve very unique financial use cases will end up on those systems. And something like what we'd call as DeFi or something that Mark Cuban parlays in. So Mark Cuban, funnily enough, he uses Erion, probably one of the largest uh, degens, as I would call them, degenerates, because he's you know, being in protocols, we, we call this as a term called rugged. If you've been rugged in DeFi, that means, you know, you're like a DeFi degen who like, you know, apes into protocols or like really is deep in the ecosystem. He's been rugged in multiple protocols where that, that what the protocol essentially means is, you know, you have an anonymous developer coming up with something that's, you know, an automated market maker or a loanable markets function. And it's, it's sort of, you know, for a temporary period, incentivized using what we'd call yield farming. So he gives out a certain token to you if you stake a certain amount of capital. And there was a certain craze for money grabbing, you know, derivatives like this, where Mark Cuban got rugged, the whole protocol lost $60 million, et cetera, you know, overnight because the guy who coded it installed a backdoor function and sort of ran away with the money. So that is something where this protocol was not audited. People were comfortable enough to like, you know, put in $60 million into the protocol, like pull together money because there's always going to be degenerate investors looking for crazy high amounts of risk and they have a high enough risk tolerance. And what will introduce a systemic risk where you know it becomes unbearable is a market where we approach um, maximum greed and we approach irrational exuberance and eventually you know we might you know go to crazy abnormal levels of um, valuations much much about you know what the actual sort of core value should be. And valuation is also interesting. There's ways to evaluate value protocols similar to how you value stuff in traditional finance. I also have that in my dissertation. But essentially, when you reach that phase of frothiness in the market, similar to what we had in 2008, um, that is when really um, you know, you're more exposed to systemic risk of, say, you know, one large um, player cashing out leading to a cash event. So there's that. Um, but what's interesting is there's everything is auditable on chain. Things like what I talked about. If you want to know how much people are fearful or greedy at the moment, you have on chain indicators that you can analyze. So you have something called the crypto fear and greed index. So I think it breaks down 
you know, by weighted proportions based on different factors, like on volatility adds a sort of uh, deviance or standard deviance, uh, sentiment analysis. You have a lot of underlying factors similar to what you'd see in technical analysis or market analysis in traditional finance that you can use to sort of make a sense of how greedy the market is, how like fearful the market is. So that is not really systemic risk, but that's more just trading the sort of narrative and trading how bullish or bearish to certain sort of, you know, market trend is. So that is always going to be there in any market, especially one as volatility if I but as for stomach risks, um, this is definitely more transparent and auditable and hence has less systemic risks where, you know, you can't have an organization in the seashells or Cam Cayman Islands really just pulling the plug on something and causing, you know, a bunch of other liquidations in other countries all around the world, similar to what we had in like 2008 crisis. Awesome. Uh, all right, so uh, I know we're coming to the end. I want to be respectful of your time. So I have... Uh... Three plus one questions, which means it's four. So I'll start with the, probably the easiest one for you to answer is um, mm -hmm. what is the ideal user for Zerion? So like um, for people mm -hmm. listening in, uh, you've gone this entire time without telling us how great the thing you've built is. So I, I just want to like add it in there and then it'll be in the show notes as well so people can check it out. But for people listening in, you know, how, how would uh, they know that it's for them? Um, there are, that's a great question. So if I, I would like to answer this by even like looking at user personas, you know, say you're, you're a banker or someone who works in finance and you're interested in exploring what this open finance ecosystem is, you enter through Zerion because we let you really like do every step of the process. Because while everything I explained seemed very intuitive, currently it's sort of like trying to use the internet in the early 1990s where really every function or every part of the process it's fragmented as different websites, different apps, different sort of extensions on the internet. And what we let you do is we have an iOS app, we have an Android app, we're the only ones who actually have a completely on-chain app, which means when you use us, you hold all your funds in your own secure custodial, custodial wallet, but you're not sort of, you're using us as this gateway to this entire ecosystem. And we have no fees, no transaction fees, whatnot. We have an ecosystem that lets you sort of plug into every instrument and derivative I talked about and do this at the best fees because we aggregate across all the other protocols that exist. So if you're someone in finance who is interested in exploring this further, if you're an Uber driver because your other Uber driver friends were talking about Bitcoin recently and you're interested in exploring more about this, if you're someone in a, you know, in a country that's not in the US and you are super bummed that you can't access Coinbase or some of these larger exchanges that America privilege to get access to and sort of get direct exposure to crypto and you can do something like Zerion as well because you sort of um, now don't go through a traditional centralized exchange but this is sort of like a very um, direct on-chain way to access this open source layer so really any user persona who's uh, sort of interested in you know, maybe earning more interest on your stable sort of savings compared to the 0.05% you get from your Chase account, um, you know, who's someone who is looking to um, understand or build an interesting use case in fintech and is sort of very, um, I would say, dis disgruntled by all the API and all the sort of data restrictions that exist. Really, I think it's for everyone. It's for sort of builders, it's for creators, it's for, you know, people who are working from home, stay-at-home moms, whatnot. And I've seen, I've seen sort of users across the whole end of the spectrum um, enter um, this with the sole purpose of trying to educate themselves on, you know, what this extra sovereign money that's native to the internet is all about. Awesome. Uh, and there will be, uh, oh, oh uh, can you like give us the www. Just so that sure. people can hear uh, it. So, so it's www.zerion.io. So that is Z-E-R-I-O-N, Zerion.io. Sweet. And it'll be and in the we're show also notes having as well. a ton of great, yeah, that's awesome. And we're also having a ton of, you know, updates coming up. So we actually just, you know, scaled, bootstrapped ourselves the last three years. We recently raised a round of funding. So there's going to be a ton of updates where until now we were actually tailored more for a DeFi native investor, someone like Mark Cuban himself. So we have a lot of funds, institutions, et cetera, using us. But a large goal with our recent funding round and a large part of my role as a product manager really is to um, how do you simplify the user experience and make this fit for a non-crypto native user? So there's a lot coming up there. Um, definitely encourage you to sort of um, check out everything and always reach out for any questions. I'm happy to help. Do you guys have a, a newsletter for people to keep up to date? Um, for something like crypto, Twitter is always the best place to so follow okay. us on Twitter because we have um, a ton of great resources there. 
but we also have a monthly lowdown news or something like what you'd get from you know, Morning Brew or Finimize, um, just sort of summarizing the state of the market, things we worked on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if, if newsletters are something that you'd like to explore more, of, um, the best letter in the space uh, in terms of hands-on tutorials as well as quality content, because crypto is a space where it's so hard to separate facts from the noise, Bankless. So B-A-N-K-L-E-S-S. Uh, bankless is a great place to you know basically start on your journey to going bankless. Awesome. Yeah, I, I keep showing up in my feed. So, uh, so I'm definitely uh, I'm going to check that out after this call. Um, so talking, awesome. about resor- talking about resources, what other resources would you recommend other than your dissertation for us to check out to learn um, about the space? Uh, that's a great question. So we've talked about newsletters. Um, I think newsletters and bankless. Um, a way to really get started in terms of resources is for you to sort of go down the rabbit hole yourself. And since I mentioned rabbit hole, um, the, the sort of process there would be, you know, create your first wallet, which you can do by Ethereum, or you can have a wallet like MetaMask. So there's different types of wallets, there's different types of educational content. And since I mentioned rabbit hole, there's a company called rabbit hole, um, rabbithole.gg, that exists. And the whole sort of uh, way they do this is they gamify the process of learning crypto. So you can sort of use that as your first step. I highly recommend as a first step to start, you, you, you sort of also earn extra XP for doing certain things because they sort of, you know, help gamify this whole process on their front end. So rabbit hole is a dope place to start that as well. Um, and in terms of additional resources, really um, a lot of times it's hard to do so because even giving resources should not be constituted as financial sort of, um, you know, financial research or any sort of financial um, recommendation. Um, and that's the sort of status of the space to so really, you know, always do your own due diligence, mm-hmm. do your own research, never ape into something because your, you know, neighbor told you to do so or because, you know, must tell you to do so. Always sort of be wary of uh, any new fads and trends in the space. And uh, Start exploring by, you know, understanding the core tenets of what sort of constitutes a lot of resources in the crypto. So rabbit hole is great. Our newsletter is great. We also have a really nice Discord where this is sort of this for those who don't know, um, a social media platform that's very different from most other social media platforms. You have your own community server and it's a very nice intimate space where we have around 10,000 users in our Discord server every day actively helping you answer questions about crypto, helping you on board. We have resources and tutorials on there as well. So our Discord would be go.cerion.io slash Discord. So that would be go.cerion.io slash Discord. D-S-C-O-R-D. Sweet. I'm on Discord for every programming language that I've ever wanted to learn. So. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah it's, it's the first thing when I open up in the morning, I, I like to read everyone having problems and then try my best uh, guess how to answer them. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to check that's awesome. out. Yeah, it's, it's truly a great uh, social media platform compared to many others out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's de- definitely better than building on Slack. That'd be like a really weird, uh, I don't think that'd work as well uh, as Discord. So I'll have that in the show notes as well. Um, awesome. Is there a problem that you have that you'd like help with? We're all here listening to you. So mm-hmm. ask Rob. What, what's up? Um, your your audience would love this. Um, so if all of this has interested you and you know you've you've got this far and you're now ready to dive deeper into the rabbit hole, we are hiring and we're hiring for um, folks who don't necessarily need to have any crypto experience as well. So we're hiring for product managers. We're hiring for, you know if you're interested in helping new users out and learning through the process. If you're learning, if you're interested in design, um, I'm always very, very um, sort of open to helping you enter the ecosystem either by Azerion or by all of our close friends. We're also like large ecosystem partners in the DeFi space, be it a protocol or be it a wallet. So really the best thing there um, is for you to check out my personal website and shoot me a message um, right down there in my personal website. And um, I think one thing, this is sort of more on the you know philanthropic side of things. Um, me as an international student, for example, I really feel the need to help others in any way to pursue their career or pursue a learning or you know skill that they want to learn so in that sense i would really say um something like DeFi, what i mentioned um is a perfect intersection of uh, finance tech game theory programming writing arithmetic reading and sort of everything together so um if you're interested in exploring that further, um do reach out uh, I will always be happy to help. So I think that's one problem that we always deal with in crypto. No matter the number of smart people in this space, there's always a need for more. And um, 
it's it's great to see the kind of exodus of people sort of um, coming in to build and stay here for the long run. Awesome. Uh, that well, uh, just a follow on then. Is there something that you're looking to learn yourself uh, that if someone out here knows about it, they could send you a book recommendation or anything like that? Anything particular? Any books that you want to keep an eye out for? Just, just, mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, I think one thing that's super interesting. Um, I mean, I, I would say I'm sort of a, a person who believes in you know sort of knowing a little bit about everything and everything about something. And I'm still on the process of knowing everything about something. And something is what I would call human computer interaction and sort of users in terms of product research or product design. So if you're someone who's, you know, studied formally in HCI and human computer interaction or has a big core interest or like some great resources to share, do share. I would love to sort of see, you know, what really um, uh, sparked your ideas and creativity in the space. All right. After we're done, I'll, I'll give you ideas because I, I think I might know some for you. Um, so then That's uh, awesome. <laughs> the, la- the last question is a question. What is a question that you have that is unanswered or a question that you'd like to leave us with? So sometimes it's fun to just like you, you, you talk the entire time kind of about like things you have solutions for, things you have questions for. And it is kind of fun to ask a question that you don't have the answer to. But uh, mm-hmm. if nothing comes to mind, you can always just ask us a question and then we will answer it in an email right. or just see um, what people say. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. Um, do you think life starts at the end of your comfort zone? Um, that would be my question. It's more very open-ended, um, and this is related to a lot of what I mentioned. You know, the comfort zone of leaving a job you have, the comfort zone of entering a completely new industry. So that would be my question. That's a question that um, I, I keep rediscovering every day. I go out of my comfort zone. So I'm curious to hear what your readers think, given the context of your sort of podcast is also you know a mix of tim ferris and a mix of sort of a bunch of different other people and style it is and you learn a lot from other people sort of really going out of your comfort zone by being mentally involved cognitively involved in whoever conversation about something you don't really understand and that was abby darshun product manager and leader of zerion remember to check them out uh links to show notes to most of what we talked about if you like this episode please let me know let him know give feedback this is a very interesting subject, you know, uh, finance in general. So if there's a lot of you out there that want to learn more about these types of subjects and, and learn and, and develop yourself, please let me know. There's literally tons of people that Abby uh, and others can you know, point us to so that we can learn more about these things together.